Now there's lots happening this weekend St. Patrick's Day Festival stuff Long weekend of course Turtle is here That's Turtle Bunbury He's a travel writer and author He's been looking at stories About remarkable Irish people Who you won't necessarily have heard of But have made a huge impact around the world And he's here to tell us about some of these people So good morning Turtle, how are you? Good morning Dave, all good Good, now you are from Carlow And more specifically Lisnava House Have I got that Lisnava right? House, yeah Very good, okay right, It's Carlo. one of the big old Irish houses What's it like by the way To grow up in an estate house? Um, well, I, I guess you uh, realise that you're one of the luckiest people in the world because they are beautiful houses. And uh, certainly for somebody like me who uh, ends up becoming a historian, uh, you can't ask for better than to grow up in a historic house surrounded by paintings and old furniture and things like that. So uh, very exciting. I'm going to take a while. Is it cold? Uh, <laughs> do you know, it wasn't that cold. Uh, my dad used to be in the Navy and uh, he figured out boiler systems and put in one that kept us all nice and toasty. And uh, Seriously, does the family go back there four or five hundred years? Uh, since the 1670s, yeah. That's when the family um, moved there first. And uh, we built the house in the 1840s, um, but there was another house there beforehand. So it's a long run. It's a long run, right back to William the Conqueror. <laughs> back to William the Conqueror, exactly. <laughs> OK, and your father is Lord, Lord Rathdonnell. Now, is, is it very difficult, by the way, for the families of estate houses around the country to hold on to them? I mean, this is the year 2017 now. Yeah, I mean, it has traditionally been, you know, hard work because those places eat money, swallow any money you throw at them they eat on you know trying to keep the roof on it and, and all the walls and everything like that but my brother and his wife run it as a wedding venue these days and yeah. uh, a lot of people might have been to weddings there I don't know um, or it was recently on a, an RT show uh, as well um, but they uh, you know I think that's the way that you sustain it by basically bringing people in from outside um, of course yeah now you love 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 history but you also love travel do you think exploring the world gives you a better appreciation or understanding of Ireland in that it offers some contrast or you don't really know your own place anyway until you leave and come back I think yeah both very much true uh, I, I spent a lot of time I lived in Hong Kong for a few years and I started becoming a travel writer out there and definitely every time I went to a new country I was always looking for the Irish uh, angle out in those countries and there was always one because there always is wherever you go anywhere in the world lift up a rock there's you know, some Irish connection under it um, and I definitely think that that uh, gave me a really valuable perspective on what the influence of this country had outside of Ireland and it is huge, I bet you're telling me. Uh, well, it is. I mean, yeah. just it really is. Um, you know, I know we, you know, we probably go on a bit too much about how, how we punch above our weight to an extent, but um, it is astonishing, really. Every, every place I've been to, I always find stories that are, you know, connect from Ireland to a foreign country, whether it's Cambodia or Hong Kong or right. Mexico or whatever. You were a freelance correspondent with the South China Morning Post and Business News Indochina. How was that gig? Uh, I loved it, yeah. That was uh, based in Hong Kong, but doing quite a lot of travel in Vietnam and Cambodia primarily um, and really exciting I was in my mid-twenties at the time and it just really opened uh, me up to all that world French Indochina as it was uh, or as it had been and it was the time of the handover when Hong Kong was passed back from British control to, to Chinese well uh, it became an independent state of sorts um, but uh, basically passed back to China so really very very fascinating for me yeah OK well now you are taking part in the St. Patrick's Day Festival the talk that you're going to be giving features some Irish people who went out into the world and made an impact. Is that the best way to look at it? Yeah, I think that's pretty pretty accurate. Um, I am homing in on, on a, a quartet of, of four uh, characters uh, who I've found absolutely fascinating. Um, I will be probably beginning with a guy called uh, Arthur Kavner. Well, hold on, before we begin, I wanted to just talk. I have here in front of me a Turtle Bunbury, a chronicle of genius, generosity and savagery. It's 1847. I have to ask first, why 1847? Um... In a nutshell, it's because it was the year my house was built, the, the house where we actually grew up in was built. Right. And so I wanted to stop the clock and see what was going on in that year. I also knew it was the darkest year, arguably, in Irish history because it was, was Black it 47. Was it the end of the famine or the middle of the no, famine? No, it was no. the middle of the famine no. and it was kind of the worst year of it. Um, and uh, so I was just trying to figure out how... What was going on all around the world in that year? And so that's what that book does. It uh, looks at stories uh, not just connected to the famine or Ireland, but just all around the world, right through to music. And in fact, funnily enough, I was looking uh, earlier at one of the stories which I think you'll enjoy because it's about Pablo Fanque. And uh, Pablo Fanque... And Pablo Fanque, don't tell me, don't tell me. Wait a minute, oh my God, I'll tell you. Go the only it. reason I'm going to say this is, OK, he is mentioned in for, uh, for the benefit of Mr Kite on the Sgt Pepper's album by the Beatles, John Lennon sings it. You are on it. There will be a show Pablo tonight. Pablo Fanque's fair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
exactly. And so the only time I've ever heard the name. Who is he? He's a circus performer, uh, mm. an amazing guy. Uh, well, I, I knew that John Lennon mm. took all the lyrics from uh, the a poster of a circus. Correct. But yeah. Pablo Fanke is who? Yeah, he was. A, he was. A, his father was an, an African, uh, basically a slave. He'd been made a slave in England in Norfolk, and Pablo was his son, who was half black, half Norfolk, uh, and was a brilliant equestrian artist. And uh, he learned how to become one of the most mesmerising performers of the day, particularly in the year 1847, right. uh, and was performing on a horse who wasn't called Henry. I was, <laughs> I was thinking, did he perform the waltz? He, he did, he performed the waltz, but on a horse called uh, Bida, I think she was oh, really? uh, yeah, it, um, it doesn't scan as well, obviously. <laughs> Henry the horse is dancing the waltz. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's take a look. Yeah, also 1847, Emily Bronte, uh, Wuthering Heights, etc. Is that important to you? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd, I'd read that at, uh, at uh, college and loved it, and uh, same with Jane Eyre, was also 1847. I mean, the list of things, the year followed me around a lot. I was uh, in Mexico, actually, and uh, being St. Patrick's weekend, it's irrelevant, uh, it's relevant to say that uh, I found myself standing in front of a monument to the San Patricios, which was this battalion of mostly Irish soldiers who'd fought for the Mexican army against the US army in this bloody war that raged through 1847. And I found myself standing on the spot where a lot of them had actually been executed uh, at the end of 1847. So again, that forms one of the big chapters in the book. Um, the, the demise of the poor old San Patricios. OK, well then, uh, you know, will the talk focus on the Irish people who feature in the book? Uh, on some of them, yeah. There's a, there's a couple there. There's uh, Richard Burton, who's a pretty remarkable uh, man, not to be confused with the actor, uh, who, a Liz Taylor actor. Um, this is Sir Richard Burton, who was an explorer. His grandfather was uh, from a, a clergyman over in Loch Corrib in Galway, and his father grew up in Galway as well. And Burton kind of grew up between England and France and a little, a little bit in Ireland, but made his name out in India, where he was just uh, an extremely eccentric uh, explorer. He initially uh, went undercover. He was an undercover agent out in uh, Karachi and places like that. Um, uh, and very successful. But uh, he was pretty, uh, as I say, very uh, eccentric to, the, to such an extent that when he lost uh, he, this beautiful Persian woman he was in love with uh, at the start of 1847, he consoled himself in a very unusual way. He bought a menagerie of 40 monkeys uh, and he tamed them and uh, managed to learn uh, enough about their language to create the world's first monkey dictionary uh, in 1847. <laughs> so that is why I was oh, initially intrigued This by is him. a true story, this yeah. is Richard Burton. Burton. Richard Burton, yeah. Wow, OK, fair uh, enough. And then went off to translate the Kama Sutra and, and discovered Lake Tanganyika and did a lot of extraordinary things later on in his life as well. So uh, a truly remarkable man. And what year are we talking about there? Um, we, he translated the Monkey Dictionary 1847 right. and then Tanganyika in the 1860s. Yeah. Wow, indeed. OK, so now, um, a Carlo-born intrepid explorer who was born without arms or legs? This is uh, yeah, an, an astonishing story, really. He was called Arthur Kavner. Uh, and he was born at Burris House in County Carlow in 1831, and, uh, and as you say, without arms or legs. And yet he is hailed as one of the most astonishing explorers ever. He became an explorer. Um, he was very lucky. He uh, grew up in a, in a wealthy household, um, and so his parents were able to sort of look after him, and his mother insisted he be brought up like all the other children, which she, they didn't do that generally in those days. Quite often you might be put off in an attic or whatever. But she uh, lavished love on him and uh, got him some pretty cool gadgets by Victorian standards, like a, a wheelchair and a, and a special saddle. Right. And he taught himself how to ride using... Um, he, he could use his teeth to pull the reins. He could also read and write using his mouth. Um, and uh, ended up being able to ride with his brother and another guy from Norway all the way down through Russia and the Caspian Sea all the way down to Iran or Persia as it was then and then they ended up taking a boat to India uh, from where he eventually shipped home to Ireland. Um, so that in itself was a pretty astonishing job to do with or without arms or legs but he did it without either. And uh, like we're talking about his travels there did he did he perform do anything did he like, were there any duties anything that he might have done when he was in any of these places? While he was there well they still talk about him in, in some of those places to this day really? because he was you know uh, 
in, in uh, over in the stands because he went through a lot of those countries that end in stands. Right, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, they still he, he's part of their folklore. This guy who turned up, he was he travelled in a sort of wicker basket, uh, and they had an entourage of servants because they were wealthy enough to do so. But uh, he really, as you know, you were asking about travel broadening the mind. He was the ultimate uh, backpacker. Uh, he was only nineteen or twenty when he set off. All right. So the Galway man who discovered Lake Tanganyika and translated the Kama Sutra. There's uh, the Carlo born intrepid explorer born without arms or legs where are you going to go with the next one <laughs> give us the leash man who unveiled the Statue of Liberty uh, well yeah Billy Grace who was a, a farmer's son from County Leash um, he uh, as a 14 year old uh, he ran away from uh, the Je- uh, Jesuit school in Ireland uh, and went to New York and worked as a cobbler uh, a, a cobbler's assistant there for a couple of years but fetched up in Peru and his timing was impeccable because he got to Peru just at the same time that they'd worked out that bat poo was an essential ingredient for gunpowder and fertiliser. And he began investing in it there and then and ended up building up uh, what is today WG Grace uh, and Company, or WR Grace and Company. I think it's one of the world's biggest fertiliser companies. And we, Billy Grace, he was the founding father of this. uh, And he was a big player down in Peru. He was known as the Pirate of Peru uh, in certain quarters. Uh, but he ended up uh, going to New York, uh, going into politics on, as a Democrat, became the first Roman Catholic mayor of New York, uh, and then did such a good job, they re-elected him, and on round two in his second term, um, the, it was the same time that the French gifted, made that extraordinary gift of the Statue of yeah. Liberty to the US, and it was Billy Grace who had to go out and accept it on behalf of the, uh, really? the US. And bring and it in. Why Obish. didn't I learn any of these things in school, or was I just missing that day? I don't know, sometimes it, uh, it's too much about dates, uh, yeah, dates, dates, dates. Probably so, although we are looking around 1847 here, just as a matter of interest, you haven't seen the series on television called Taboo, have you? No, unfortunately mm. not. Well, one of the very big sort of plot points in Taboo is the fact that there is no gunpowder and they make it out of bat poo. Ah, my goodness. It's, well, it's, there it's you a go. Very, right. It goes through about four or five of the programs, yeah. Okay, well, I shall have go. to watch it back to back. So you're not lying. Okay, <laughs> okay can we go for um, some, somebody who isn't a man? The Sligo woman who became the mistress of the King of Bavaria. Well, this now, <laughs> this was um, an, an extraordinary story that played out again in 1847. At the time, the King of Bavaria was a guy called Ludwig. Um, who'd had a very peaceful reign for 20, 30 years before uh, this time. And we st- we're still talking <coughs> pre-1850-ish. Yep, we're, we're right. in 1845, 46, moving right, into yeah. 1847. Yeah. Um, and he got hooked on this beautiful, exotic flamenco dancer um, who was uh, apparently Spanish called Lola Montes. Uh, absolutely hypnotised, ends up showering her with palaces and titles and lots and lots of cash. Um, and then it slowly emerges that she is actually Rosanna Gilbert from Ireland, or she was born in County Sligo. Uh, her mum was from Limerick, her father was a British soldier, and she had a sort of ex- a mad upbringing between Ireland uh, and Scotland and India. Um, then a messy first marriage to a guy from Wexford, uh, and she decided to reinvent herself, and she came, comes back as this uh, exotic dancer, uh, goes goes off to Europe and ends up um, romancing people like Alexander Dumas, author of The Three Musketeers, yeah. and Franz Liszt, the composer, before she hits the jackpot with King Ludwig. Um, but it all comes, uh, it basically, the Jesuits are extremely powerful in Bavaria at that time, and they are not happy with having this charlatan from County Sligo uh, in, the, uh, you know, in the king's mind. Uh, so ultimately, he has to abdicate the throne, and she heads off to California, where she sets up a dancing salon for the gold miners um, a really astonishing woman I must say fantastic and, uh, a beauty Correct. ok let's stay there back in the middle 1800s um, uh, like the, 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 there's plenty of other fascinating stories we're talking about 1847 not necessarily people are, are we like what about the Cunard Liner uh, the Cunard Liner was, was going to and fro quite a lot of the time bringing uh, again a, a very Unusual people. It brought Frederick Douglass to Ireland um, and away from Ireland. He left Ireland in 1847. Frederick Douglass was uh, in America. Every school kid would know who uh, Douglass was, but he was uh, had been born on a slave plantation, managed to run away, uh, and when you broke out of a slave plantation, the first thing you had to do was look up and find the North Star in the sky so you could make your way north to the free states in Canada. 
Um, he wrote a book about his experiences uh, and then realised that uh, slave catchers were still trying to catch him. So he came to England and Ireland and spent six months in Ireland travelling around, loved Ireland, had a really good time, got on famously with Daniel O'Connell um, and uh, was down in Cork all over the place uh, before he shipped back to uh, America where once again he found himself facing prescription on account of the colour of my skin uh, and he founded at the end of 1847 a newspaper which he called The North Star. So, do all of these stories, like, does the famine tinge just about every one of them? It, you know, it, it's inevitably going to cast a very big, long shadow over uh, events far and wide. Not everywhere. There's a few stories. The French are, uh, actually launched their first bombardment of Vietnam that year. I couldn't find any hint of a famine influence over that. Uh, apart from in the sense that because so many Irish are moving, I mean, you've got un- I mean, hundreds of thousands of Irish leaving Ireland over the course of that year. You've got cities like Toronto. January 1847, the population is 20,000 people. At the close of that year, it's trebled to 60,000, most of the newcomers Irish. So that inevitably has its own knock on effect as people start moving forward to try and find land. The Mormons make their way to Salt Lake City, Utah in 1847. That's the year that's founded. So it really is a a massive, a massive uh, impact from it. Okay, just as a matter of interest, books-wise, I mean, how many? You've got about 12 different books. You've travelled extensively, as I mentioned the places earlier on. Lenny Abrahamson has a thing on the cover of your book here where he says, the best thing the turtle has done so far. Vivid, surprising, hugely entertaining, an unforgettable encounter with an extraordinary year. So... 1847 is what it's called, Turtle. There's lots more stories in here of lots of different things around the world, not just in any way 100% related to Ireland. Correct, yeah, and lots of stories about showbiz and characters, the people who were uh, influencing that world, people like uh, Stephen Foster, Oh Susanna, that had its premiere that year, and uh, uh, Franz Liszt we mentioned earlier, but about circus performers and ballerinas, (laughs) and (laughs) everything from uh, uh, to uh, warlords like Kenesari Khan of the Middle, Middle Horde, who you wouldn't necessarily want to have breakfast with back in uh, 1847. Very ter- scary man. Okay, well, 1847 it is. Now, let's get back to what you are actually doing uh, in terms of, like, weekend and stuff. Um, you are, what exactly? It's, it's, it's Turtle Bunbury, Saturday, 18th of March, which is today, obviously, uh, at lunchtime. Oh, just a couple of hours' time. You're, yeah, you're it one, is. Um, one till two. One till two. I am, yeah, taking part. It's the Discovering Epic and Dublin Docklands event, which is down at Epic Ireland in the CHQ building on the Custom House Quay. Um, and if your listeners haven't been there before, I strongly recommend going, whether today or not, down to Epic Ireland, because it's really cool. It's the story of the Irish abroad, what we're talking about here. But they've presented it in a really intelligent manner, if you ask me. I, I brought my daughters down a, a few weeks ago. They absolutely loved it. Um, it's just very uh, fun, fascinating, and, and very 21st century. OK, by the way, the theme for the whole festival is Ireland, you are. So listen, enjoy it. You better get going, because you've got to get down there. So thank you so much, Turtle, for talking to us. And the book is out at the moment. It's called 18. 18- 47 by Turtle Bunbury. Thanks, Turtle. You're most welcome, Dave. Dave Fanning on 2FM.